even though I don't know the answer, even though I'm not sure about what I'm doing, even though that the only thing that I'm doing with my wife is I'm praying and we're crying together and we're singing worship. That's the best that I know how to do. And God will take that, right? What's worship? People always look at worship and they say, you know, worship is when you go to Sunday service and you raise your hands and you sing songs to God. That's not what worship is, right? Worship is when we do the hard things and we honor God in those things. And we submit our flesh, when we submit our bodies to God, our minds to God, our hearts to God, that's true worship. Father is critical. You are so important. Three nuggets that hit me from my conversation with Mark today were one, how to lead in your home. What does that look like to lead in your home? How to have a mission for your home. And I loved this. If mom is tired at the end of the night, the family has failed her. How to show up for mom. Welcome to Fatherhood Field Notes podcast, where I interview just the most incredible fathers, gaining wisdom from their stories for you and I to each grow in our own craft. I'm your guide, Ned Shout, father to five kids, currently ages 11 to 18, and husband to my smoking hot wife, Sarah, working on our 20th year of marriage. It's crazy. So yeah, I'm in the thick of it and I'm working daily to rebel against the low expectations for fathers. And I want to create a world where fathers know who they are and know how to show up for their families. You and I have one of the greatest opportunities to impact our world through the way we embrace our fatherhood role. This episode is brought to you by The Adventure of Fatherhood, helping men discover their powerful fatherhood role and build their fatherhood skills. The role of the father is to serve, guide, provide, protect, and of course, find joy and have fun in the messiness of it all. Today's guest is my new friend, Mark Hernandez. I learned so much. We laughed. We each had a little cry and had an incredible time talking fatherhood. Enjoy. I regularly ask good people, hey, who's a good dad I should have on the podcast? And and our mutual friend, Matt, had brought your name up. Why do you think when I said, hey, who'd be a good dad to be on the show, Matt thought of you? Man, uh, well, first of all, Matt's a good guy. So, you know, he's he's just a top-notch dude. Um, But we've gotten to talk and gotten to know each other a little bit. And he knows how much I do with my kids and how much I do with my Mm -hmm. family. And so he knows that I put that at the forefront of everything that I do and everything that I think of. And so I think he feels that I'm a pretty good dad, which is an honor. You know, it's good to hear from another guy that is not related to you, that you're a good dude. Yeah. Yeah. That's so true. I love the two things you said there that stuck out to me is it's an honor, you know, and, and I don't know that we, we necessarily lean into that word enough in this day and age. Like what does it mean to be an honorable man or to be honored? Right. I don't think a lot of us men, dads are really honored very often. So that means (laughs) something, you know? And then the other thing that you said that was cool was you said from another man, that's not related to you. Cause I think like, and, and maybe you can, why did that seem like it mattered to say that he's not related to you? Um, I think it's important when other guys see you and see an attribute in you that maybe they want to take a hold of and say, hey, I like that about mm. this guy. I'd like to wean on that and take a little bit of that. Right. They people will always yeah. pick from the fruit of our tree. Um, mm. And if we're if we're rooted solidly in the things that we believe in God, in family, then people will see that and they'll want that, um, yeah. which which is which society especially right now with the way that the climate is talking about toxic masculinity and all these other things, it's, it's, it's so hard for a man to want to be a good guy, right? They Mm. want us, they want us to be weak. They want us to look like we don't know what we're talking about. Even in movies, everything that my daughters see, they look at men and they're like, that's, you know, dad, why aren't you like that? And I'm like, why am I not like what babe? And they'll, they'll ask me like, you know, how come you're not a real soft guy? Um, and I, and I told him, cause I'm a man, this is how God created me. He created me to do certain things different than your mom. Um, otherwise yes. we would be the same. So when Matt, when Matt has seen, and he hasn't seen me really engage with my family more so than he has, um, heard me talk about it. Um, yeah. but to see another guy that's not related to me say those things that you're doing, I want to do a little bit of that. It honors mm-hmm. me because yeah. Again, I'm trying to figure it out. So <laughs> it's not yeah. perfect. 
Yeah, love it, dude. All right, got a few uh, questions right out the gate for you. How old do you find yourself today? Oh, man, I'm 38 years old. I don't feel like it, but my body, <laughs> my body definitely is telling me I'm 38. <laughs> love it, dude. How many years you've been married? I've been married now for 12 years. So this will be my 13th year in September. Love it, dude. Congratulations. Thank you. And uh, how many kiddos do you have? I've got a total. And what of, are their ages? I've got a total of four. And so um, if you, I well, I got a total of four. I've got a, two 12 year olds. They're six months apart. And that's a story in itself. Um, they have different moms. And so my son just turned 12 uh, last week. So I got a daughter that's 12, a son that's 12, a daughter that's eight, and then a daughter that's four. Okay. And then are you done? Cut off? That's it. No more. That's all. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's all we can handle. <laughs> nice. And then where do you reside? Where's the family reside? Uh, we live in Levon, Texas. And so Levon, okay. Texas is in the DFW area, about an hour north of uh, Dallas proper. Okay. And then what do you do for a living to provide value for the world and, and support the family? Yeah. So I'm a teacher and I teach at Legacy Christian Academy. I teach art, okay. which I love. And then as a hobby, um, I do art. I, I paint. I, have an, I am currently an exhibiting artist and I'm trying to get into different things. Um, but the thing that I love the most, if I could if I would not do either one of those things is I would just work at my church where I'm uh, the youth pastor. I am a minister mm. there. I teach an adult small group. And so we got a busy schedule. Yeah. Yeah. Four kids, multiple jobs, marriage, all of it, dude. It, it adds up without a doubt. When thinking about fatherhood, in your opinion, what is the role of the father? And I typically don't ask this question till later in the conversation, but I think with the foundation of, of, of the convictions of your faith and, and how I've just read through kind of like who you are, I thought it would be a good place for us to start the conversation of like, what in your opinion is the role of the father? I think the role of the father serves three important things. So the first important aspect of a father is that we must be a provider and a provider can mean several different things, but we Clearly, we have to provide financially, we provide emotionally, and we provide physically for mm -hmm. our families. And so those three mm -hmm. aspects go into that one into that one thing. So number one, a provider. Number two, I think that you have to also be somebody that's going to make rules. So I wouldn't call it a boss, but mm -hmm. I would but you have to be the head. You have to be the mm -hmm. leader. You could not subvert that job to your wife or to anybody else, to your kids, to nobody. You have to lead. You have to be mm. the one that steps forth and says, this is the mission that our family has. This is the trajectory that we're going forward on. And if anything causes us to sway from it, then we we try to get back on track. So number two, you got to be a good leader. And number three, you have to be a servant, bro. You have to be a servant. Mm. There's no other way to to, to be a good father if you're not a servant, if you're not serving your family, if you're not serving your spouse, if you're not serving your kids, you have to be able to do those things. Because sometimes I want to only lead and I'm so focused on leading that I forget about the necessities of my family. Um, and what I mean by that is I, I mean that my kids will get lost sometimes in the intricacies of my life. Right. And I have to remember, I have to pause for a minute and say, hey, these kids, they need their dad. They need yeah. somebody who's going to serve them. They, my wife needs a husband. She needs somebody that's going to serve her. And so sometimes I have to take off that pastor hat or that artist hat or that teacher hat. And I have to really put on that servant hat and say, what do you guys need in this moment? And so I feel like a father is represented well in those three things. Yeah. Ah, dude, super well said. So, uh, provider out the gate, love it. Right. And very clear. There's multiple areas. We're not just talking money here. Right. Uh, and then leader. Right. And, and what I liked what you said about leader, uh, because we could almost combine leader and servant, like if we're writing this perfect book, you know, but 
you made a comment of the rules, right? Like you said, uh, the dad needs to make the rules and, and enforce the rules and, and, and be that guide. And I just agree, right? Like we're having situation in the house where the kids just aren't following through on some of their chores. And it's like, I need to be the one to step in and lead that. Right. Yeah. So that's the part of like a take charge kind of opportunity that I have. Right. And not put that on my wife to just be the nag. Uh, yeah. right. Cause she doesn't want to be the nag, like, dude, dad show up. But then, you know, the third component, if you're going to break servant f- away from leadership is I need to serve. And, and man, I, I, before I forget, you said that the kids could get caught up in the intricacies of your life. And I just find that could be so true about me. Like when you're a go getter and you're leading yeah. a community and you're doing things <laughs> like even your wife mm-hmm. can kind of fall into the intricacies of your life. Um, so I love that you have an a- awareness and acknowledgement of that. Yeah. Appreciate so it. before I say my next comp- part to that, is there anything, any tools or thoughts that you would share with dudes who are like, yeah, like <laughs> I definitely can find my family kind of, uh, serving Ned's world or serving Mark's world, right? How do you ensure that it's not just about you? Any thoughts around that? Oh man, I, it's 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 such a difficult process because every situation yeah. lends itself to something specific right and so having that good balance is is always key and for me the thing the thing that grounds me the most and you know this um is that is my faith i mean first and foremost yeah. i i'm i have to be grounded in in the lord if i'm not grounded in the lord right i wouldn't be the person that i am today i wouldn't be the father that i am today i wouldn't be the husband or the servant that I am today, because, you know, my background is pretty rough. I didn't grow up with good examples of these things. And so I've had to figure it out um, <laughs> through through fire, I guess, going through fire and going through different trials that have shown me my mistakes. And so I would say being grounded in that, in in the faith of Jesus Christ is first and foremost for me. Yeah. And as you say that, I just, I'm, I mean, in reflecting on my own life, sometimes I go, man, life is so messy and heavy, so many decisions, so much stuff. It's, it's almost like, I don't even know how I would exist without being able to wake up and be like, yo, God, I'm tired. This is hard. What do I do? (laughs) You know, and I might not always get this audible voice saying, oh, no, you need to do X, Y, or Z, but just knowing I'm not alone. Yeah is so and that it's not all on me right um go ahead and and i and i will say if i can share just one one of my most intimate moments is um my wife and i had a miscarriage and Mm. in that time i was i was broken i didn't know how to be a leader i didn't know how to be a husband i didn't know how to be a servant how do you go to a perfect god and feel comfortable right at this time Mm. i'm i'm already teaching i quit my, I quit coaching and I lost a stipend so that I could do church full time. And, and then we lost this baby. And I was thinking, Lord, here I am. I'm serving you. I'm working for you. I'm doing these things that essentially are good things, positive things. And this is how you repay me. You repay mm-hmm. me by not giving me this child. Like you take my daughter from me. And, and, and you know me, I have four kids, so I love kids. <laughs> yeah. But, um, but I, in thinking that, I also had to understand if I wasn't rooted in God, I would have turned to alcohol. I would have turned to gambling. Mm-hmm. I would have turned to I would have turned to a fleshly idea that I had that would have taken me far away from God that would have led me to cause hurt in my wife, hurt in my family, something different. But what I did instead was I remembered, go back to the scriptures. You're not the only man that has suffered in this way. You're not the only person that has looked at God and had that emotion of God, why me? Right. And so looking back at the scriptures, being rooted and founded in that helped me to tell my wife, listen, I don't have the answers, but I still want to lead you. And the way that I'm going to lead you is we're going to sing worship in our living room as I play my guitar and cry with you. Because I don't understand. I don't have the answers, but I know that God is still good. I know God is still relevant. So we're going to do this together. I'm going to lead you in worship as we cry in our brokenness. And we're going to do this. And that's the best that I can do. And so mm. if I weren't rooted in my faith, I would have done something completely different. I, I Honestly, I don't know what I would have done. So, okay. So I kind of have an interesting thought question to bring up to you. Yeah. Um, we'll see how this goes. 
because I'm in agreement with you. Um, and one thing, like you, basically, in that you know, you could turn to things that would be hurtful to your family. Okay, so then I was like, oh, but there there are people who've chosen the the faith, but let's use a different word, the religious route, and have caused a bunch of pain and headache with their family through going too deep in that route. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to ask you, <laughs> yeah, I was going to yeah. ask you, like, how do you do that? And I'm going to tell you two things I heard you say that I'm like, oh, he just gave me the answer, but I want dudes to think about this is you said, I went down the faith path and, and two things to my wife, I'm going to come and we're going to do this together. I don't have all the answers, right? So you didn't take the religious path of, well, I have all the answers and the Bible says this and God says this. And then you said, I'm going to do the best I know how to do. Mm. So because somebody could take the religious path, that's not what you took. You took the faith path and cause havoc and pain in their families. Any other thoughts, you know, that you would share with somebody, you know, when something happens, there's a, in life, such as the miscarriage that we can choose religious religion, or we could choose faith. And I'm, I'm clearly just using those. So there's right. a distinction, you know, it's all, it's all good, but it's just so that there's a distinction. Any other thoughts you have around using our faith in an appropriate manner for healing and community, et cetera. Right. I would say that for me, um, I serve, you know, I serve a God that I'm not always going to understand. Mm. I'm not always going to have the answers. Imagine if we served a God that we understood everything that he did. He would, that would be a terrible God to serve because that would make mm. him equal to you and I. But mm. my God transcends my problems. My God transcends my issues. Mm. My God transcends anything that I can possibly think of. And so in knowing that, I can rest assured that even though I don't know the answer, even though I'm not sure about what I'm doing, even even though that the only thing that I'm doing with my wife is I'm praying and we're crying together and we're singing worship, that's the best that I know how to do. And God will take that, right? What's worship? People always look at worship and they say, you know, worship is when you go to Sunday service and you raise your hands and you sing songs to God. That's not what worship is, right? Worship is when we do the hard things and we honor God in those things. And we submit our flesh. When we submit our bodies to God, our minds to God, our hearts to God, that's true worship. Being mm-hmm. able to put ourselves aside and understand that God is in control, that's where we worship the Lord. Right? I'm not saying that singing to Him isn't worship. It is a form of worship. But a real form, an honest form of worship is saying, God, I don't have the answers, but I trust you. And I, mm-hmm. and, and I can worship you enough to say, it's going to be okay. Like my hurt and my pain, is it real? Yeah. It was very real at that time. Yeah. Is, have I forgotten about it? No. Sometimes, sometimes we'll be talking or we had a friend who had a miscarriage a couple of weeks ago, man, I was crying like a baby because I I remembered that hurt. I remembered that pain. I remembered those moments, but I was able to share with them what got me through. And that was, that was huge for me. I never thought, you know, in that moment while I was sharing with you earlier, I was like, God, why me? Why are you putting me through this? Of all the people, why now? Why, why is this happening? And it was, and it was for this moment. Last week, our friends, they had, you know, like I said, their baby passed away. I was able to share. I wouldn't have had the ability to share or to empathize with them even if I hadn't had gone through that myself. And so just knowing and understanding that God's in control I would say would be the biggest, the biggest thing in this situation. Yeah. I want to make a distinction and you can have your opinion on this and and share it. But when you're asking God the question, why did this happen? Um, I think sometimes there's this assumption that God, see, it's tough that God, not that he made it happen. Maybe he allowed it to happen or it just happened. Right. And, and I think that sometimes people are like, I need meaning for this uh, because, you know, bad things shouldn't happen to me because I'm a Christian or because whatever the reality is, is we live in a messy world and just things happen. The difference I think is that God can use those things or, or redeem those things. Let's say like he didn't say, Hey, I need this to happen to Mark so that he can share with these people one day, but Hey, let me put Mark on the path with these people because this happened to them too. And he can share his story with them. Any, any difference of thought on, on the the wording around that? No, I agree with you on that. That's a. I, I would say that we're on. We're tracking on the same page when when it comes to that. I don't. I don't believe that 
you know, that God will cause anything evil to happen to us. Um, but when we do go through those hardships, we live through them and we come out refined, right? He says that yes. we're like, we go through the refiner's fire to be mm-hmm. made better, whatever that looks like for you, whatever that means for you. Um, whether it be a death, whether it be loss of a job, whether it be loss of a business, whatever that looks like to you or for you, you will be refined through that. Because, you know, coming through and honoring God and what you do, again, worshiping him during that time is still a necessity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then I just want to go back last thing, because this this has just been kind of powerful. And, and when God throws things at you from a couple different angles, you're like, I want to pay attention to that. But the third thing you said was to be a servant and to serve your family. And it's just so rad. Two nights ago, I'm at dinner with my wife and we were talking about her and just how, you know, celebrating her and how awesome she it was her birthday. So it was just her and I out for dinner. And, and we, I was really honoring that she just sees needs in our home and she serves. And so I want guys to hear this. I think sometimes when we hear the word servant, we think of like the lowest of the low, right? Uh, right. We think of like peasant serving, whatever. But the word to serve, like to walk into a room and be in tune with your wife or your kids, right? And to know what do they need? How do I serve them is such an opportunity as a man, as a husband, as a father. I mean, dude, our words are so powerful to walk into a room and see what the need is. And then with our voice, speak the need, you know, like go in and and, and meet the need. Um, So any other thoughts from you on just the idea, the opportunity a dad has to serve his family? I would say that the service of a father is is of utmost importance. Um, mm-hmm. And and here's and he, and here's how I like nitpick. I nitpick all the things when it comes to my kids because they're so different, right? The way that yeah. I communicate with my son, for example, this morning I woke up and I told my son, "Hey, get your butt up, get dressed. We're gonna go to we're gonna go to the park and play some tennis." Um, and my daughter was here also. We're on spring break, and so my oldest daughter and I said, "Hey, hun." Can you please go get your shoes on and so we can go? Right. And I'm serving them differently. My son, yeah. I can I can speak to him a little bit more forcefully, a little bit more in a in a rough like using a little mm-hmm. bit more rough language where my daughter, I have to be a little bit more soft with her. And even in that, what you said is important. Our speech matters as dads. Right. Yes. And, and so yes. and so I'm looking at my son and I'm like, hey, I want you to know that you can be firm with another man. That's OK. You can be firm mm-hmm. with me as your father. Um, but the necessity that you have is that I teach you how to speak correctly to another person, to another man, to myself. What kind of communication do you and I have? And the same thing with my daughters. So I am a little bit softer with them, but I still expect them to, I still require of them to be respectful. I still ask, you know, ask them to see what they're doing and make sure that everything's okay. And so I'm serving them in that way. Um, Another good thing about it is this last weekend we were camping and we went hiking up a, in, at a, in a canyon. And, uh, and I told my son, I said, hey, I want you to lead, right? Let, mm. let, me, let me show you what it looks like to lead. And I told him, I said, look, we're going to be going up a very steep climb. Your sisters are going to be scared. They're going to cry. It's a part of being girls. I don't want you to make fun of them. I don't want you to look at them and laugh. I said, I want you to be a strong leader and I want you to encourage them. A part of being a leader is you Mm -hmm. also cannot go as fast as you can, because this is if you're leading, then I'm allowing you to take reins of this family right now. And you have to turn back and look if you've gone too far. That's too much, bud. you have to slow it down. And so serving him in that way also and giving him a little bit of a taste of what does it look like to lead a family, even in something as small as we're hiking right up a steep, <laughs> up a steep Canyon, <laughs> even in something as simple as that teaches him the understanding of I'm not always first, even though I'm at the front of the, of the group, I'm not always first. I have to look back, make sure that the flock is doing well, make sure that they're on par, things like that. And with my daughters, hopefully they can see myself and my son and say, Hey, this is a great example that I can look forward to in a husband and someone that I'm dating, whatever the case might be. Um, getting a little bit of a glimpse of, Hey, this is what it looks like. And for my wife, if, if we're real, we have to serve our wives, man. Like we want our, yeah. we want our wives to serve us physically. I would say one of, one mm-hmm. of our needs as men is, is that physical touch. Um, I know it is for me. It's, it's huge. And so I wanted, I wanted to serve me physically. I want her to, I want to be in worship with her physically. 
And sometimes yeah. she's working on the hat. She's working. She works from home. She has a job. She cooks. She cleans. Every day when I come home from school, my food is ready. My kids are, you know, their homework is is being done and everything. And if she's doing all that, then I've got to serve her physically in, in a certain way as well, right? I have to come in and if there's anything that I can do, like I'll take care of all of the outside stuff. I'll mow the grass. I'll do the weeds, whatever needs to be done. And if I see that she needs help inside, then I'm going to help her. I'm going to serve her in that way. So, you know, so she doesn't feel like, man, my husband is a bum. He's not doing anything. He's yeah, <laughs> he's yeah. just watching me and, and, and I'm taking, I'm so tired at the end of the night. I don't want to serve him because I'm so tired. Um, and I think sometimes as men, we, we can forget that, right? We can forget that we must serve our wives as well so that we can be in community together um, and have that good relationship. Yeah, it's good, dude. Now, the, the podcast is Fatherhood Field Notes. You're doing it, opening up your field notes, sharing your life with us. The mantra behind it is rebel and create. When you hear that, what's something that you're rebelling against and what do you hope to create out of that? Like you've been talking about it, where men, men want to be firm, men want to fight against something, but not just to be a destructive, you know, and tear things down, but to then create in its space. So when you hear that, what's something that you are rebelling against and what do you hope to create out of that? Right. One thing that I'm for sure rebelling against is the way that I grew up, the way that I saw men in my life. Um, you know, my father was not a very good father when it came to leading, um, when it came to showing me what it was like to love his wife appropriately, to love his kids appropriately. Um, eventually, my father ended up passing away because of the choices that he decided to make. And, um, and so he left us damaged and broken. And so the thing that mm. I've been trying to rebel against this whole time is not falling into that same pattern that has existed for generations in my family where, where a father doesn't have a, a good root into the ground. Right. And everyone always asks like, what do you think the good root is uh, for me? It's always going to be being rooted in the Lord. Like the, Jesus Christ is my cornerstone. I turn to the, I turn to the men of God and I turn to the scriptures in the Bible to show me what that looks like. I can read about it, but now what do I do with that? As a, as a young man, people would tell me, hey, the Lord loves you. I'm like, well, that's good. I'm glad that he loves me. But I'm, I'm reading these stories and I still don't have a dad. <laughs> you know, I'm, yeah, read, yeah, yeah. I'm reading these stories and I still don't have somebody that's showing me how to be a good father. That's what I want to know. And so my rebellion is against, against that stigma, against those stereotypical Latino male machismo type uh, stereotypes that say you're a man when you are able to sleep with a woman, you're a man if you can drink, you're a man if you can hold a job, you're a man. It takes a lot more than that to be a man. Mm. It takes a whole lot more than that to be a man. And that's all I saw my father do, right? My father didn't have a relationship with the Lord. Um, his father didn't have a relationship with the Lord. Um, and so breaking out of that mold has been my rebellion. And it's been hard, man. It's been really, really hard. Because I can only gl take um, glimpses and nuggets from these men who I trust, who I know are Christian yeah. men, and I'm trying yeah. to and I'm trying to build something with that. Right? I have the foundation, which is the scriptures and Jesus, and then I'm trying to take these nuggets from all these other guys and trying to build something. And sometimes the things work, sometimes they don't, and I got to yeah. refine it. Right? I got to continue to rebel against the idea that I'm that I'm perfect now. I'll never be a perfect father. I'll never be a perfect uh, man. I'm refined each and every day when I wake up. I'm, it's a new process, right? Like, like our sanctification. Every single day is a new day. We're, we will never reach a point as fathers where we're like, all right, I'm done. Best dad in the world. Yeah. Give yeah. me the shirt. Give me it's the mug. We're, we're finished. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, something that you said that really stuck out to me was – um. I mean, obviously, so you're sharing about the Latino culture, culture and, you know, when you can sleep with a lady, when you could drink the way that we drink, you know, but then you made this comment, if you could hold the job and it struck me as yeah. interesting to put into that same bucket, you know, because the first thing I asked you is what's the role of father? And you said to provide, uh, which yeah. didn't just mean job, but I'd love to unpack that for a minute because as I'm pondering it, as you said it. I do think us men put way too much identity in our job, 
And yeah. that's not what makes you a man. It doesn't mean you don't need to go hold a job and pay for the family or provide. But why was that in there? And and yeah, what else would you say about that? I would say this, Ned. My father, as long as I can remember, he always held a job. But he was very, very absent from my life. And mm. and for me, that's something that continues to hurt. Um, everything that yeah. I do with my yeah. son, everything that I do with my son, I wish that my dad did with me. And when I look back on that, it still hurts me. I'm 38 years old. And I will tell yeah. you right now, if I could have my father and, and if I could have my father right now with me, I would. I would. And, and I would say, look, you know, look at how I am. Look at where I am. Because we're always seeking for that father figure. We're always looking for that father figure. My dad, I knew my dad was a hard worker. But my grandparents essentially raised me um, because my parents were both young parents. They didn't have careers. They held jobs, but they didn't have careers that paid them well. And so they were very absent from a lot of things in my life. You know, I did a lot of things in, in middle school and high school. Um, I was the first to do a lot of things in my family and my dad wasn't around for it. My dad wasn't around. My dad wasn't, my dad was absent when I graduated high school. My dad was absent when I graduated college. My dad was absent when I did everything. And so wow. I would have rather him had not as good of a job and been there for me than, yeah. <laughs> than for him to always be absent from my life and have a phenomenal job. And, and that's, that's the distinction for me, right? Is, is, is what I'm doing in providing for my family good for them? It might be if I'm making tons of money, but I'm absent from their life, then I'm missing out on the important parts, right? Yeah. I can teach my son about how to work. Let, let's put it this way. I can teach my son about stock, the stock market and he can be a millionaire. But if I never tell him about God, if he never knows about what it looks like to be a good husband and a good father, then I've taught him nothing. Yeah. Yeah. Is there a story, a, a positive or negative? I, would, I was going to lean towards positive, but I'll leave it up to you. Of, of a story of you and your father, like, like a connection point a moment in time that mattered that, that, uh, shaped you in a positive or negative way. Yeah. Um, you know, for the longest time, when my dad decided to leave my family, he came to me and he said, and I never understood this. And to this day, I still don't understand it, but it did shape me when he decided to leave my family. He said, this is your family. Now you're the oldest son. And so this is you like, this belongs Whoa. to you now. And when he told me that in my mind, as, as a Latino male, I don't disrespect my dad. I can't disrespect mm -hmm. him, right? I have to honor him. And so I said, yes, sir. And I held my mom and my two brothers and my sister in my arms and they cried and I couldn't cry. And, wow. and, and, and we were in tears and I was, and I couldn't cry because he told me this is your responsibility. Now, later on, I'm thinking, what the heck? I don't want to have anything to do with this. This isn't my family. These are my siblings. Mm -hmm. This is my mother. I don't want this responsibility. And it shaped me in such a way that I that that it made me think, I don't ever want to, I don't ever want this. I don't want to be a dad. Yeah. I don't want to be a father. I don't want to, I don't want to have a, you know, this isn't something that I want. Why does this belong to me now? Why did you give me this this burden? Um, and it, and it took me a long, <laughs> it took me a lot of years of, of therapy to realize and to understand that it wasn't mine because for the longest time, yeah. for the longest time, it weighed heavy on my heart and I went to college and so many times college was really, it was a hard time for me. It taught me a lot. It was a time of healing for me as well, but my family weighed so heavy on my heart. And it was because my dad gave me that prerogative and said, hey, this is now yours. And, you know, that was a very, I, I don't know if it would, if it would be classified under negative or positive, because I, I learned a lot from it too, in, in retrospect. Yeah. yeah. How old were you? I was 18 years old. Wow. Yeah, I was 18. Wow. Wow. Um, how was it, you know, I mean, you said years of therapy, which kudos to you for doing the work, bro. Uh, yeah. Doing the work is, is important. Um, was there a moment 
you're 38 now. So was there a moment in the last, you have a 12 year olds. So in the last 12 years where there, you, you like looked in the mirror, you woke up or you were like, Whoa, okay. I'm the guy now. And I'm yeah. stoked that I'm the guy, <laughs> right? Like, like I'm happy to carry this. Was there a moment for you? Um, that I can think of not really, because it's been, like I said, it's been a process. I thought that I had it all <laughs> yeah. down with my daughter and then my son, cause they're so close in age. And then we had our second yeah. kid and she was so different. And mm-hmm. I had to reevaluate how I serve her, how I, how I talk to her, mm-hmm. how I lead her. And then we had our four, our four year old when she was born, then I had to reevaluate again. Um, <laughs> yeah. And so, <laughs> and I think, I think what, what's, what's, this weekend, it, w- it was really an intimate weekend. Um, like I said, um, we went we went camping for the first time. I've never taken them tent camping. We've always been glamping, but that's not camping, you know. That's <laughs> that's <laughs> that's for the birds. Um, and so we stayed in the tent. We cooked. We did all these things. Oh, and in man. and and in that moment this weekend, they were really looking at me for the first time in complete submission. Like, we don't know what we're doing. We don't know how to set up the tent, dad. We don't know how to do anything, Mm -hmm. dad. I told him, put your shoes outside because you don't want to dirty the tent. And then in the morning, get up, you got to shake your shoes out. So there's no critters in there. And, you know, we went up, we went up the Canyon, we came down the Canyon and it was such a beautiful moment. And wow. And in that time I was like, this is, this is mine. This is my domain. Mm. All of this belongs to me. Mm. The, the Lord has entrusted me to take care <laughs> of these little people. <laughs> yes. Yeah, and, bro. And hopefully I'm doing a, a good enough job so that they don't grow oh, up and yeah. be psychos in the world. Um, no. <laughs> but that's, but that's you know, they, they have their own personality. So I can only feed into them. I can only water them. And then the, hopefully the Lord grows them how he needs them to grow. Um, but I'm just a steward of these children. I'm just watching over mm. them. I'm just making sure that I know to do the things that I need to do to try to bless them. But I really can't do much else because one day they're not going to be with dad. One day they're going to have their own families. When they leave the walls of my house, they will no longer belong to me in a sense, right? Mm. That now they'll be their own person. They won't be under the purview of dad. And hopefully I've instilled in them something that that's meaningful that they can hold on to and say, I want to be like my dad, right? That That's where, where I felt like I don't ever want to be like my father. I don't want to follow in his footsteps. I don't want to smell like him. I don't want to comb my hair like him. I hope that my son doesn't look at me like that. I hope he says everything that my dad taught me. I want that. I want to be like that man. Cause he was an honorable guy. Ah, uh, bro, for real, like tears in my eyes thinking just this moment we got to share after you went on this camp trip and just had this magical I mean, I know it's been a process, you know, for you, but like you're here, you have arrived, you're that guy, you're in it, right? And just like we said, you know, when I say arrived, it's like, we all know, just going to constantly change, but you are, you're, you're the craftsman. Dude, you're the craftsman. (laughs) I'm just super proud to be connected to a dude like you, because it's like, we need guys like who are in the struggle, in the Mm -hmm. fight. Um, and man, just going back to something you said when you talked about your dad passing the family to you, you said, I don't want this burden. And, and I think we hear the word, I want to get your perspective. I think we mm-hmm. hear the word burden and yes, it was a different burden for you because it wasn't your burden, but it was your dad's burden. And, and it was an opportunity for him. So like you and I, like I've got a big family, you got a big family. We both have burden to carry, Mm -hmm. but it's a gift. Yeah. So what's your thought on that? Right. So basically a burden's not bad if it's been given to you to take care. What do you, what do you think? What comes to mind? Right. So I, I always compare my earthly father with my heavenly father when it comes to things like that. Right. My heavenly father has given me my children and and essentially they are a burden. I want to whoop them half the time that they're with me. <laughs> <laughs> to, today, you know, they're, they're constantly arguing, and so yeah. a, a part of it, I would say that it is a burden, but it's a positive thing that the God that God's right, given me right. to to take care of, to nurture. This is to cultivate. Um, where 
when my dad left that, left his family to me, man, immediately, like I took it to heart and I'm like, how do I teach my brothers how to be men? I don't even know how to do that. Mm-hmm. How do I teach yeah. them? What do I yeah. tell my brothers about, about who they will become? I don't know how to do that, you know? And to this day, I, they've always kind of looked at me as a father figure. And, and I finally had to have that conversation with them where I'm like, listen, I'm not your dad. I'm your brother. Mm. Like, come to me for advice, but understand that I don't have all the answers and understand that the things that work for me may not work for you. And I can't force you. I can't do anything because I, I didn't raise you. I couldn't mm. have raised you. And so to, to this day, sometimes mm. we'll get together and they'll look at me. And I told them one time, I said, listen, the only reason I didn't quit college is because you were my burden. And I thought to myself, mm. if I quit, they're going to see a man who's quit again a second time. Uh, and that man, yeah, that that part hurt me because I'm like, there were so many times, Ned, I'm sorry, man. No, I love there, it. Dude, there, good. There, were, there were so many times where I wanted to quit college because I was the first person in my family to do it. I had no business being at Lubbock Christian University. It was too expensive everything. I I had no clue what I was doing and I wanted to quit. And the reason that I didn't is because I I had it in my heart and in my mind. And I've shared this with my siblings. I didn't want them to see another man quitting. I didn't. And I made it through and I, and I made it through it. And now I'm laughing. I'm like, guys, listen, this burden wasn't for me. Why do you have to look at me? And, and, and in a way that, and, and sometimes Mm -hmm. they'll throw it in my face. Like, I've had the conversation with, with my brothers and, and my sister and where, where they've, they've kind of felt like just because you did it doesn't mean that we have to do it. And I'm like, you're 100% correct. Don't, <laughs> I'm yeah. not your, I'm not your, I shouldn't be that, that top, the ceiling for you. Right. I'm not your, yeah. I'm not your glass ceiling. I'm not, I can't yeah. be, I'm not your dad. Like our dad was our glass ceiling for us. I've already broken that. You guys have already broken that. And so move forward, move, like continue to do good things for yourself. But those are the two different burdens that I had in my life is number one, you know, like the burden that I'm in now, I love it. And, and mm-hmm. looking back, I'm looking back at my dad. I'm like, I don't understand how you could have left and looking at my yeah. kids, you know, yeah. there were, there were four of us. Um, and my dad left four kids and his wife and he moved, he moved on, right. He moved on to do his own thing. I look at my kids and my wife and I could never leave them. I, I, I just, I just yeah. don't see my heart and my mind and my body would not function if they weren't in my life. And if I didn't have them with me, it's just, it, it's incredible how much fatherhood means to me yes. now, mm. to, to me as a man. Now, back then when I was sitting there with my siblings and my mother in my arms, I didn't want to have anything to do with it. I didn't, I just, I wanted someone to hold me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So, and, and now as a dad, I couldn't let it go. Now I embrace my family as much as I can. And if they want to cry, cry on me, cry on me as much as you want. Come on, bring it to dad because I'm here yeah. for you. So you, you've shifted what it means to be a father. You're, you're, you're showing your family, your daughters, your, your, your kiddos, what it means to be a man, what it means to be a father. Uh, and you've broken, you know, those things. And you've set an example for your own, you know, siblings, which, which wasn't your responsibility, but it was given to you and you, you've made the most of it. I want you to fast forward like 20 years from now. Because you're also going to be setting the tone of what a grandfather means. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And so I want you to think just for a minute, because I want men to start thinking. Like, I think sometimes when we think about the future, we're like 40, right? Like you're mm-hmm. 38, you said, yeah? Yes, sir. Yeah. Yeah, I'm 40. So we're like, we're in the thick of it right now. We're yeah. in the thick of the best, you know, most productive years. We're making an impact on society, whatever. Some of us have this idea like, I'm going to retire at 65 and then fill in the blank with whatever. Mm-hmm. That's not what I want. I want to have massive impact and influence in, in, in family. So when you think about being a grandfather, what type of grandfather do you want to be? Man, I've already told my kids. We actually, we were talking about this <laughs> um, this week where <laughs> I was cool. like, I told my son, because he, he'd said something. He was like, dad. Like, 
you, you're teaching me how to do these things. Are you, you know, you're going to teach my kids how to, I was like, no, no, bud, I'm not like, that's your job. Your job is going to be to teach your kids those things. And when they come okay. to, when they come to grandpa's house, then they're going to get a different version of me than you got. Because mm. now, because now it's not my responsibility to raise them. It's yours. And then hopefully you're doing, you're doing it in a way where like I've taught you, dad has given you all the secret sauce. Now the sauce is yours. Now you have to make a new secret sauce with the recipe dad gave you. And then you have to share that with your kids. And then when they come to grandpa, they're going to see, oh, we see the sauce that dad has. It used to be grandpa's. And so, mm. <laughs> and so my, my duty as a grandfather, my ability to, to mold my kids' kids, I would assume would be different. Not that I don't want to lead them, but that won't be my role. Right. My role will as a grandfather will be to support my son, to walk beside him and to continue mm. to be that for him. And mm. when and when his kids come to me and like, you know, if, if if he has a son, then he can glean off of the things that I know. Um, but hopefully my son will have already given those things to him. Wow. Wow. It's yeah, it's good. It's really good. Um, I don't think I've thought of it that way. The idea that it's not my responsibility to raise them, and and you didn't even say that you wouldn't influence them, but right. but the but the you talked about continuing to support your son, which I think is beautiful, right? Like I'm going to continue to support my son just because he's 18 and he left the house or he's married. Now there's a difference, like, and you made it clear, right? You're not parenting him, but you're there for him, right? right. In a different capacity. Um, and it's not your responsibility to raise your grandkids, but, but to be their support and, 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 and maybe just hold space for all of them. I yeah. don't know. As I talked for a minute, what else came up for you? I think that that's a good idea because again, just like I didn't want my siblings to be my responsibility. I don't want my mm. grandkids to be my responsibility. And, and the honest truth, Ned is when I married my wife, we came together. So I'm, I'm, Hispanic, I'm Mexican. My wife is half white, half black. And so our cultures, when we got together, we had oh, a cult yeah. we had a culture clash in some things and in some things we didn't. And so my mom was expecting me to do things a certain way. Her mom was expecting her to do things a certain way. And I said, and I came to my wife and I said, Hold on, we can't do that. Like your mom is not has no influence in my in in my biome. And my mom has no influence in my biome. This belongs to us. So we have to create mm. now a space. That's what God has given us, right? God has made me the leader of this family. And in your submission to me, you, we walk beside each other and we have to create this new monster, if you want to call it that, right? This new entity. Yeah. <laughs> we have to create this new entity and we have to function in that and we have to protect it. And I'm not going to let anyone enter into my garden and try to plant anything or uproot anything Whoa. or do anything like that because it belongs to me. That That's my job. That's my responsibility. And so the same way that I feel that about myself, I would never impose that on, onto my children. I would never go into their biome, into their garden and try to do anything like that because that belongs to them. Now, if they say, Dad, I planted these things in my garden. <laughs> I don't know how to keep them alive. Then I can yeah, have yeah. Some, then I can have some input, right? But I would never impose myself onto their relationships with their spouses or their relationships with their children, um, because they have to create that. That belongs to them. Dude, super well said. Is there any advice you would give to a dude who's like, man, I have not set good boundaries with either my wife's family or my family. And like my garden has no freaking walls around it. Everybody's coming in, coming out. And I'm just kind of like Mr. Nice guy. I try to apologize. Is there anything practically you would share to that dude who's done a crappy job of that? Yeah, I would say you have to really sit down with your wife. And you have to come up with what you will and won't allow. That way you have a good plan. Because if you don't, that's when you start getting those influences that come into, into your space and, mm. mess, and mess you up. And so yep. when, when I decided to do that, so one of the big things for us was Christmas, right? Okay. My, my, yeah. mom, my mom, we didn't grow up with a lot, so we got very little for Christmas. And my wife, she grew up getting whatever she wanted. 
And so it doesn't matter. To this day, she could ask her mom for whatever, and her mom would get it for her. And so whenever we got together, I said, okay, we have to meet in the middle, or we have to come up with something. What are some things that you enjoyed about your Christmas? And then I'll give you some of the things that I enjoyed about my Christmas. And we combined those, and we made a new entity. And now, whenever whenever people try to feed into that, we're like, no, nah, we yeah. already do it this way. We're not changing it. I'm sorry if it hurts your feelings, but this is how we do it. And so it, one, one of the, that was one of the biggest things. Ironically enough, one of the happiest moments of the year, which is Christmas, was one of our biggest arguments with our family um, because my mom, yeah, you know, it's bomb. like bomb, bomb, bomb. And I'm like, no, 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 no. Hold on. This is how we're doing it. This is how Michelle and I have chosen to do Christmas. What I did with you guys as a kid, that's fantastic, but it doesn't work here because this is something new. And so just just setting those boundaries and having those having those moments with your spouse where we plan everything, man. We plan absolutely everything. We sit down and we talk about our finances. We talk about the meals we're going to eat. We talk about as much as we can with how to raise the children, even even as even so far as to discipline, right? Like the other day, we we had already planned. I'm like, listen, if the kid misbehaves while I'm not at home, you cannot wait for me to give the punishment. Like it has to be dealt with right then and there, because if you don't deal with it, they'll never respect you as, as mm. their mother. They'll never give you that same honor that they give to me. And you need to have that. I need you to I need you to want to be able to have that where the kids look at you with the same amount of respect as they look at me. And so, and she waited until I got home and I was like, did your mom deal with it? And they said, well, she said to wait, wait until dad comes home. And so I, in that moment, I looked at my wife and I said, Hey, is that true? And she said, yeah, I did tell them. And I said, okay, well then it's been dealt with because you chose, you know, you chose to not do anything. And so Mm. now, now you put that responsibility on me and it is my responsibility. And so I can only talk them through it now because I don't know. I don't know what it was that, that you had decided with them. And so my kids got to see also my wife and I have that discussion. Yeah. Which is good. I never saw that it. It is my so parents. good. Yeah. It's so good to be able to, to let your kids, you know, um, experience the growth, right? Because the reality is as parents and adults don't have it all figured out, you no. know, like I thought my parents <laughs> did, but the, the reality is, is like you're figuring it out every day. And to whatever extent you can allow your kids to see that and be a part of that is really special uh, because it's going to help shape them for like, this is real. But dude, I, I mean, a couple things is you said multiple times, we plan everything. We sat down and decided how we wanted to do Christmas. We, 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 which you know, when you start to say words like leadership and stuff like, you know, my wife, uh, you know, surrendering to me or whatever. Sometimes I think people get, you know, like they don't realize like, wait a second. No, I said, let's, let's sit down and talk about this. Let's, let's plan. Let's, what do you want? What works for you? And really creating that collaboration because I think some dudes either go way too strong and they, just do whatever the hell they want. Some dudes are just so passive that no woman's going to respect him because he just does yep. whatever she wants. He never steps in. And then third is like, you're, you're giving your wife a voice. And, 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 and I think a lot of women, regardless of what the culture says, right? Our culture says that we have given women a voice in a lot of ways. It feels like smoke and mirrors, mm-hmm. but in the context of your home, men, we have to give our wife a voice and, and, and not just, not just the naggy voice, right? Right, Like we joke about, it's like, it'd be, and if you're (laughs) experiencing that, if you're experiencing that, that's because you haven't done your due diligence to create enough margin to sit down. And what are the expectations? Like, what is it that matters to you? And then how do I come in as the, so here's a great example. And then I'm going to ask you my last question. Like my wife just, it's like, she cannot have peace unless the kitchen's clean. She just can't. Mm-hmm. And, and, and on one hand I could be like, dude, what the heck? Like, just sit down, chill out, whatever. 
or I could just let her do it every day and be pissed at us. And we just recently, about four or five months ago, set this new standard. We have five kids. Every kid has a shutdown at the end of the night. So I don't care if it's nine o'clock, nine thirty, ten 10 o'clock. Every kid has a shutdown. And then another kid in the next morning has to empty the, um, the, the, the dishwasher. So yeah. that means like all day people can just load the dishwasher and it's like, dude, I just have to enforce that. And life is so much better, but yeah. I had to give her a voice instead of saying, you're just like your mom or you're, this is annoying or why can't you get over it? Or if it matters to you, do it yourself. Like all the things that seem like, why not just say that, but give her a voice. Like, why does this matter? And then be the dad that implements some strategic strategy to make it happen. And then freaking beat the kids. Uh, <laughs> they don't do it. <laughs> no, you, you're 100% correct, man. That's, that's exactly how I run my household. It's like, um, laundry is huge for us because okay, there's there a ton go. of us, right? Yeah. And, and so I told my wife, I said, look, I see, I come home and I see she's tired and all the laundry is done. I'm like you're an incredible woman, but you're my wife and I don't want you to be that tired. There's, a, mm. there's six of us. So let, let's look at this. So my job as a husband is to be the head of the body, right? And her mm. job is to submit to, to submit to me. And here's what that means. It doesn't mean that she's lesser than me. It means that I have a mission and she comes, she comes right alongside me, right? She's subbing that mission, submission, right? She's coming alongside the mission and we're pushing forward through it together. So I said, here's what we're going to do. We'll get together and then I'll put all the laundry in or you'll put all the laundry in. One of us will, will put the laundry in. The other one will do, will do the dryer. And then whenever mm -hmm. we get it all out, we call all the kids and we say immediately start looking for your own clothes. We're going to, your mom's going to teach you how to fold it. And then we're all going to do it. I do my, mine as well. And then we all put it away. And my daughter's immediately, dad, why do we have to do this? Right. Why can't mom just do it? And yeah, so, <laughs> you're like, <"Nope." laughs> and so, and so my, my response to them was, well, here's the thing, guys, we're a family. We are not your slaves. We don't work mm -hmm. for you. We don't do anything for you. Do we serve you? Yeah. We serve you by working, putting a roof over your head, giving you clothing and things like that. Aside from that, we're a family that's on a mission together. And, and our mission is that if one of us fails, we all fail. And so mm -hmm. if your mom is really tired at the end of the night, we have failed her because she's done way uh, too much. Dude, that's so good. Right? She's, yep. done, she's done way too much. So your responsibility as a member of this family is to pull some of your weight. Now that you're older, now that you understand more, you'll do more. And as your siblings get older, you will all do more because you're part of this family. If you weren't a part of this family, I don't care. We can have guests here. We'll do their laundry, whatever. Um, yeah. We're not going to do it forever. <laughs> and they're not welcome to stay here forever. But, <laughs> yeah. but you guys have something to do and you have to get it done because that's what being a family is, is helping each other out doing what you need to do to further the mission of the family. So all mm. of you guys are submitting to this mission. What's my mission? Getting the laundry done, right? I've come up with the plan. All of y'all submit to the mission and here we are now and we have a good plan and it's been going well, right? So yeah. that's good. That's, that's how I do everything. That's good, man. And I, I think um, if we could, as men bring that, as fathers bring that into our home, if mom is burnt out, tired, pissed, by eight o'clock, that means we failed her. That does, yeah. That's that's and, and and dude, our kids are all. I mean, good gosh, we live in 2024 <laughs> uh, in America. Our kids have the best lives ever, right? They can freaking help out and get things going in the house. Yeah, um, yeah, love it. Okay, my friend, dude, I've so loved our time together. Uh, I love your laugh. I love your approach to life. I, I just really had a great time meeting and connecting with you. My last question for you is a legacy question. If you were to stand in a cul-de-sac and peer into your children's homes in 30, 40 years from now, they, they, they may have families, they, they may be married, there, there may be kiddos. When you peer into those windows, what is it that you see being played out and it puts a smile on your face or a tear in your eye to go, I showed up. I, mm -hmm. I did what I was supposed to do. The one thing that I always tell my children every single time, and especially my son, my son, because he's my only son. I don't, I don't have any other boys. I always say, listen, always do what is going to honor God. 
doesn't mm. matter what you do as a job. You can sell tacos on the street. You can sell hot dogs out of a hot dog vending machine, whatever. As long as you're honoring God, it doesn't matter to me what you do. You, you know, you can, whatever, you can rake leaves for a living. I don't care as long as you honor God. So the one thing that would bring that, that joy to my heart is seeing every single one of my children with their kids and their family leading out of the, out of the scriptures. That's the Mm. one thing that, like I, like I was telling you before, if I, I can teach my kids about business, I can teach my kids about, about anything, but if I haven't given them the gospel, then I haven't taught them anything. Because at uh, the end, at the end of the day, when we pass away, all that stuff stays. When I, when when I become dust once again, all of my money that I have, everything that I have is going to be here on the earth with my kids, and that's what I'm going to leave them. Nah, I'm going to leave them with the understanding that they will see me again because they because their dad served a God and gave his life to the Lord, and they'll see me again. And so mm-hmm. that's, that's what would bring the most joy to me is for all of them to follow the Lord in such a way that, that they're unwavering, that they cannot be moved. Their foundation is strong in God so that when all this hardship comes, because they're going to have hardship, right? That's yeah. the one thing that we know for sure that we'll have in this world is taxation and hardships. And so, <laughs> <laughs> and so when, when we go through those hardships, are you going to be rooted and founded on the principles of God? Because if you're not, you're going to be swayed by a lot. And so that, that's, that's what I'm hoping for, Ned, is that they, that they all understand and know how important that everything their dad did, every decision that I made, every choice that I made was rooted in Jesus Christ. Would you tell me a little bit about your art and then where people can find it and learn more about it? Yeah, so most of the art that I create deals with um, bringing the things of the heart out. And mm. so a lot of it... A lot of my paintings, a lot of my work deals with um, healing, either personal healing that I've experienced or healing that I've seen happen in other people's lives. It's all Christian art, which is hard in itself to promote um, because everyone wants to know about the, the Mexican artist, but nobody mm. wants to know about the Christian artist. And yeah. so <laughs> when I start talking about the, the heritage and the Hispanic aspect of it, everyone's tuned in. And when I start talking about the Christian aspect of it, people get turned off by it. Um, but my mission is to continue to make Christian art. It looks different. So I'm not painting pictures of Jesus necessarily. It's stories that relate to how I see God move in lives. Hmm. And, um, and I will continue to do that until I can no longer paint. Um, but for those that are interested, if you want to check it out, my website is markhernandezfinearts.com. And you can look at the art there. You can make, um, requests, or if you want something painted or something done, a commission, uh, you can reach out through that website. Again, it's markhernandez.com. Mark and then Hernandez what's your Instagram? Arts.com. My Instagram is mhfinearts, mh underscore fine arts. Mark, keep doing what you're doing. Keep loving that family. Keep uh, living that honorable life, man. Every day, serving and loving your family. Kudos to you, and thank you for spending uh, some of your life and time and sharing, uh, sharing it all with me until next time. What a great conversation with Mark. Uh, I loved so much his, his three, uh, items around fatherhood that really sat with me, you know, to be the provider, uh, to be the leader and to be the servant. And just unpacking that with him was really meaningful. And then the thing that I'm taking from this conversation into my own life is if mom's tired at the end of the night, then me and the kids failed mom. We put too much on her. And I just love that part of the conversation. It's something that I definitely could lean into more in my own home. My friends, if you enjoy the podcast, please write a review. I spend hours finding people, interviewing them, editing these and getting these out because it matters. And Mark said it clearly in in this conversation. Fatherhood matters. We have a ton of power as fathers and the way we show up has impact on our world. So please write a review. Thank you to all you dads out there listening to Fatherhood Field Notes podcast. What you do matters. Don't be like everybody else. Be yourself. That is who your kids, spouse, and community needs. This is your guide, Ned Shout. Together, let's rebel against the view that fatherhood has little impact and create lives engaged in mastering the craft of fatherhood. I look forward to hanging out with you next time.